on this special episode of Movie Geeks United, we are speaking with Randall Johnson, who is the co-writer of the 1991 biopic of the life and times of the band The Doors. Uh, and the film was, of course, entitled The Doors, directed by Oliver Stone. And uh, Mr. Johnson has been gracious enough to give us some of his time to talk about the process of being the co-writer of this film on its on the celebration of its 30th anniversary, which is really hard to believe. So what we'll do is we'll get into it. Uh, we'll get a little background about your life leading up to your uh, being asked to be a part of the project. You can tell us a little bit about uh, your uh, interest in Jim Morrison in general and all the things that led you to that, if you don't mind. Sure. Uh, full disclosure... Um, I did not work with Oliver on it. I actually wrote my drafts of the screenplay about three and a half years before he got involved in the project. For for viewers, if they've um, of movies, you know, and they and, and they will go and they'll see writing credits in films, um, and sometimes there'll be three or four names on the credits. Uh, one way to tell if uh, writers work together or not is the ampersand uh, symbol. If there's an ampersand between uh, between names, so um, that means uh, that those two writers or three writers worked as a team and wrote the screenplay as a team. If the word and separates the writers' names, it means that they worked separately and so did their drafts in you know whatever chronological order. Generally, the first name that appears on the screen. Uh, or it's uh, like in The Doors, for example, written by J. Randall Johnson and Oliver Stone. Uh, that's that's a sequential order um, there as well. So I was first on the project, wrote two, three drafts of the script. And then um, three and a half years later, Oliver came aboard and wrote his. So we, we actually never really met uh, until he was coming aboard. And we we had about a half hour meeting. <laughs> and I'll I'll tell you about that uh, a, a little yeah. later. So, uh, but that's that's the thing. So I was never really on the set or, or anything like that. So I'm I'm hoping I'm not going to di um, to disappoint you, Adam, with uh, with what you were hoping some uh, for some tasty details <laughs> behind the scenes uh, of stuff on the on on the set because I really wasn't around for that. Um, but I have other other <laughs> interesting uh, details on this on this wild and weird uh, trip that that it really became. So uh, I've always been a music freak. Um, I have two older brothers who were ten and twelve years older than me. So I, I there was always music in the house that I was hearing, and uh, you know when I was growing up. Um, you know, they were listening to rock and roll and country and all sorts of, of great, great music. And so I got exposed to a lot of stuff. One of my first memories, though, of of rock and roll music when I was I was uh, just about uh, eight years old. I heard Light My Fire on the radio and I was actually playing miniature golf with my dad and we finished up the round and we went back inside this arc, you know, in California and right Camp Pendleton, which was, um, you know, a place where a lot of Marines would come and <laughs> uh, <laughs> play games and stuff before they were, you know, during training or before they were being shipped out to Vietnam or whatever. But uh, uh, I was after a round of miniature golf, I remember my dad said, hey, go return the clubs to the counter. And I did. And I was weaving through all these uh uh, tall, really tall guys are all Marines just kind of standing around. But I remember hearing Light My Fire playing um, during that time. And I, um, it was just sort of otherworldly. It was just something I'll, I'll never forget. I, I don't know what it was. It was just something about the sound and the, the experience and everything. I felt uh, a little older than, than my, my seven or eight years at that time. Anyway, uh, and this was, you know, 67. So um, right when it was when it was on the radio, um, I would uh, go on to UCLA Film School. So that's where uh, that's where Jim Morrison and Ray Manzarek uh, both had attended and Francis Coppola, you know, who mm -hmm. was obviously a big fan um, because he used, some, you know, certainly the end in, in Apocalypse Now and whatnot. But um, I got to film school in started there in the fall of 1979 and arrived at a time when I there were still a couple of uh, no, three 
three or four instructors still on the uh, staff there who had instructed Morrison and Manzarek themselves. So there was a kind of a, con a continuum. They were, you know, oh, wow, this is where Ray and Jim had gone to school. <laughs> and so they had occasional stories about those guys. And, and, and I think it was just all kind of part of the, the folklore of film school and, and that, that kind of UCLA tradition. It was pretty cool. So there was a fascination with all of that. Um, after uh, I got out of film school, I, I, L.A. was kind of exploding with the punk rock and independent music uh, uh, thing that was going on. And I was out seeing bands all the time. And I ended up working um, a lot with uh, a band called the Minutemen and then uh, Black Flag and Henry Rollins, who was the singer of Black Flag. And and I made, made music videos for these bands. And so I was really kind of close to the music scene and, and whatever. Um, and I really, my ambition was to be a director. Not uh, I wanted to always write, but I wanted to write and direct and all that. Um, but uh, anyway, so I, I was a Doors fan. I wasn't a Doors fanatic, but I was a Doors fan, you know, and I, and, and so you can't live in LA. You cannot go through UCLA film school without their name being evoked and, and sort of, you know, followed a hushed term in some, <laughs> some way or other. Um, and once I got, once I got out and then, um, I started focusing more and more on writing, um, because at UCLA and then, you know, in the real world, you have to finance your own films. Um, uh, and it, if you were doing an advanced project, which was 16 millimeter film at that time, you had to finance it yourself. And I just didn't have the money for it. Writing paper was cheap. And I said, shoot, man, I'm just going to, I'm going to, I'm going to type, <laughs> see, see if I can get established uh, a, a name for myself as a writer. And then hopefully I can have enough success at some point where I might be able to direct my own, uh, my own film someday, you know? Um, so it actually turned out where I did more writing than directing. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, as, as, as often is the case. And, uh, oh, over, over a few short years, um, I was, uh, uh, I, I had a, a fair amount of success. I, I had a movie called Dudes that was made that Robert Richardson shot uh, for Penelope Spheris, the, the oh, yes. great director. And uh, it's, it's a punk rock Western. It's a really weird kind of cult film. In fact, they just screened it here in um in portland a couple of weeks ago and uh it was wednesday night cult film night <laughs> at the star, <laughs> star theater here in portland and it was really it was really a lot of fun um but it starred john crier and daniel roebuck Catherine mary stewart and you know uh lee ving and all these characters from the rock and roll scene in, in LA at that time. And, uh, but Bob Richardson saw it and, and he actually, I mean, shot it and he, he made a huge impression on me when I was, uh, um, there on the set a lot because, man, this was a guy who was right in the trenches. I mean, he took the camera right in, they had a, a punk rock mosh pit happening on the first day of shooting in this, in this fake club set up and I was I got there and I was so impressed by because he was right in the center of it and Penelope cast real hardcore punks to be a part of it and you know it was just uh it was just like a really it, it was it was a cool it was a cool thing anyway long story short that once dudes was in production you know your stock goes up anytime you have a movie in production and uh, my agents at the time were really circulating my name around and I got a call actually. Well, it was a, a, my, my roommate from college was going out with a young woman who was a uh, head of development at Columbia TriStar. And she had been handed the, the doors project. Um, and she self-admittedly, God bless her, said, I'm square when it comes to music. I have no idea what, <laughs> whatever, how they handed her the keys for that. I don't know. But um, she went to her boyfriend, my former roommate, and she said, Mike, you got to help me find somebody who really knows rock and roll and all this. And he says, Mike, you know, Randy, you should go, you know, talk to him. So I had an inside kind of thing, plus another movie in production. And um, and suddenly I was having a meeting with the, uh, the producer on their project, Sasha Harari. And we had... Uh, we had, I, I was not doing well when we first met. I, 
anything that I was saying didn't seem to land with him. But then I made a, I drew a comparison between Jim Morrison and Lawrence of Arabia. <laughs> and that really seemed to catch his ear, you know, and he, and uh, what I thought was going to be about a half hour meeting ended up to be about two and a half hours. We just sat there and talked more and more, but I argued there were posited that Jim Morrison and Lawrence of Arabia were very similar people in that uh, uh, they were both about the same age. Um, they were both swept up by the events of history. Uh, they were very bright, very well-educated, intelligent young men uh, and charismatic. And uh, the events that swept them up, it was they found themselves riding kind of the, the, the wave of, of, of history. And what, what happened was that the public perception of, of them, or at least of Lawrence, as it was perpetuated by Lowell Thomas, the newsreel, uh, news journalist at the time, you know, um, uh, perpetuated a, a guy who was a very romantic warrior and this and that and all that. And um, and people started buying it. You know, it was a romantic, very romantic character. And, and to a degree, I said Morrison was the same thing. But the that was the public persona. The private, personal guy was entirely different. In real life, Lawrence uh, was gay, you know, and and. Um, had to hide that, and um, so in in a sense, the the disparity, the discrepancy between the public persona and the private person was getting stretched and stretched and stretched further and further until they came to a breaking point. And uh, with Lawrence, he was captured by the Turks and tortured, and you know, and uh, it made it made him humble again. Let's put it that way. <laughs> and uh, with with Morrison, there were there was there was something that had happened, I think, that or, or was going on that he knew he was living a lie. And this stretching point, this breaking point, kind of came in a in a more of a um, not quite self destructive way, but but something like that, where it just it, he couldn't take it anymore, you know. Um, and uh, so. Uh, I didn't have any specifics in, into that, but that was my, that's what I argued. <laughs> and mm -hmm. I did my sort of film school, you know, film criticism <laughs> kind of way. Um, and uh, Sasha bought it. He, he thought that was very interesting. So um, I ended up, I'm in a, then in having a meeting with the surviving doors and, uh, you know, Ray, Robbie and, and um, uh, John Dinsmore. And, uh, and John, who the drummer was an actor at the time, or trying to act, he said, "I hey, I hear, I hear there's a movie you know you wrote that's in production. Is is there a part in it for me?" <laughs> and uh, I said, "Sure, yeah, of course, John. You know." <laughs> um, I said, "Let me call the Penelope, and uh, I'll, uh, I'll 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 we'll, we'll we'll find something for you." And sure enough, you know, I called up Penelope, and much to her credit, she says, "Oh yeah, I know John. Sure, I'll give him a part." And so he's in the movie, and he plays a he plays a cop. He plays like a sheriff in <laughs> Montana. He gets blown away <laughs> by a shotgun at <laughs> some point, you know. Um, but uh, I was able. I was glad to be able to to deliver on that. Um, but Ray and Robbie were, um, you know, Ray was particularly uh, 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 seemed to be interested that I had gone to UCLA, and we immediately started talking about some of the same instructors that we had, and we just kind of bonded very quickly. Ray was producing the band X at the time, the punk band X here in Los Angeles. So he was very much part of the kind of the punk scene to a degree. And uh, and so when I went in and I met them, you know, I, I said, I, I, I've got to tell you, I don't think the doors are 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 like flower power and, and hippies, per se. I said, I, I think you guys were much more beatnik and much more uh, punk rock. And. And for, you know, I don't know who you're going to cast, but it better not be somebody like like John Travolta, because John Travolta is not very punk rock. I said, you'd be better off casting Henry Rollins or somebody that has that kind of edge to them for that. I think Ray was impressed by that, you know. And um, Anyway, the upshot was that I got that job out of that uh, that meeting in. And I started writing the script. Um, the producer said, take a couple of weeks to uh, go research and, uh, and then start writing the script. <laughs> <laughs> it didn't work out that way. 
So I'll, I'll go on to your next question there. Yeah, so. well, that's a, that's an interesting trajectory. It really is. And the time frame we're talking, I guess this would be the late 80s. We're this thinking was, I can tell you exactly what it was. It's 1986 because okay. I got yeah. I, I was hired to write it, I think, early about March 86, maybe early, early um, first couple of months. And I spent the whole year working on it. Yeah, because I know that there had been several aborted, you know, there were press releases, it's coming, it's happening, and then it, something would happen, it would fall through. And so, yeah, I figured these things take sometimes a while to actually come to fruition. So, so yeah, so, uh, and then Oliver Stone, of course, his career caught fire in 1986 with Platoon. I don't have to tell most of our listeners probably are way ahead of me on that one. And then there was Wall Street and Talk Radio, and then another huge success with Born on the Fourth of July. And so at this point, he pretty much, I think, had carte blanche on what he could uh, do. And so this was his uh, his next project. And so this is where you two come together. Uh, yeah, I mean, I, I think what, what happened, uh, you know, he was, he was slated to direct uh, the film version of Evita with uh, starring Madonna. Uh, right, yes. Musical. And then that fell through. Um. And I, I was long off the project by that time, and uh, you know, and and I'll back up uh, here just a second. That at the end of my time of writing my two drafts, three drafts of the of the screenplay, um, I was essentially fired off of the project at the time. I had fulfilled my contract, but. Um, uh, I was clashing with the producers and mainly the head producer, Sasha Harari, um, over the content and the approach that I had that I had uh, uh, done to the uh, uh, to the whole subject. He didn't like that I had framed it and set it up around Jim Morrison's uh, last birthday where he came into the, the recording studio at Village Reporters mm -hmm. and just recorded all of his poetry without the doors or anything like that. But when I, I got the transcript of that of that recording session and you can hear it now on, on on YouTube for the whole thing. I mean, it's just like, God, the things that are available to writers now that I, oh, yeah. if, I, if I had had them back then. Oh, my gosh, it would have made my life so much easier in so many ways. But I had access to a lot of the actual people who were there as opposed to, you know, uh, other 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 types of media if you want to call them media and and that can't be replaced but um anyway uh i was struck by that that recording session because i i, I felt like on some level he knew he was dying or he knew that he wasn't going to be around much longer i was struck there was some kind of poignance to it and uh, that um and a perhaps a melancholy but it was almost like he was. It, I, I was struck by it, like he was putting down his last will and testament in his own sort of mm -hmm. fractured, poetic way. And I felt like that this could be something that could be the framing device for the whole story, and that we can come back to it several times throughout it. Um, and this was, uh, uh, and then we could hear his own words. You know, uh, it, it can provide kind of like a running commentary mm -hmm. of what we're seeing, you know. And Sasha didn't like that. He did. He said, no, we can't see this kind of this big lumbering guy who's all bearded and looks very haggard, looks like a bag person, you know, pushing a shopping cart coming into the, you know, the recording studio. People want to see the young, hot, sexy guy in black leather pants. And I said, well, no, but that's the thing. That's of course, that's what they're expecting. This, and that's the story. You know, how did he go from that to this guy here at the end? What what was the journey? What was the conflict? What drove him to look like what he was here at, towards the end? Yeah, Not sure. Terrible, terrible looking, but he just was he'd kind of let himself go. Yeah, that's I think that's a good I think that's an excellent approach. Uh, you know, because you've got some there's a dramatic arc there that where you can take things. And right. uh, and, and so that and that's very important. Um because without that, you—that's <laughs> the uh, the skeleton upon which the whole thing rests. So uh, yeah, yeah, that's, uh, yeah. So it was. Um, it, it, so anyway, he he they, they didn't. He and uh, uh, an associate they just really pushed back on that, and I pushed back on them. 
and I was I was young and full of piss and vinegar in those days, and so, I, <laughs> um, and I, I felt very passionate that this is the way to go. This is how to this is how to structure it and and all that. And uh, so they they just said, uh, no, if you persist with this, we're going to fire you. And I persisted with it, and they fired me. Um, and they they went on to a couple of other writers. Um, uh, subsequent to me, they threw out my script and they started from scratch. And then they hired and fired a couple of the subsequent writers who um, they weren't pleased with the script. I never, well, I, I read them years later, um, but uh, I, I, I heard that they were not happy with the screenplays or Ray wasn't happy with them. And then uh, I ran into Ray. Um, this is now three and a half years later at a, at a, uh, a little club on Fairfax uh, and he was playing piano. He's backing up my friend, Michael C. Ford, who was a poet who had become my friend because he I had interviewed him because he had been good friends with Morrison um, back in the day. And Michael and I uh, still chummed around quite a bit. And when Ray saw me there at that show, he kind of pointed to me um, during a break and, he, and called me over and he said, hey, you're going to get a call from Oliver Stone. And I said, well, what are you talking about? He said, well, he, he, um, he's on board now to direct the movie. And he asked to read all the previous screenplays that had been written. Um, and he said, we were at this pre-production meeting last week. And uh, he came in and he said, well, I read all the drafts and I want to work off of Randall's. So um, and <laughs> he said, don't be surprised, you're going to get a call. And sure enough, within the week, I got a call from his office and come down when they asked me if I could, you know, come down and meet him. And that's where we, we, you know, kind of laid eyes on each other like a couple of gunslingers, you know. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, um, so he was asking me, you know, about he uh, about my drafts and the research that I did and and. Um, uh, some of the stuff that I, I, I had uncovered was that Jim had some uh, issues in the bedroom. And uh, and this didn't, uh, this was another thing that Sasha was not happy about. And uh, because I, I, I didn't focus on them entirely, but I alluded to them. Okay. And, yeah. uh, and uh, sort of like uh, they alluded to Warren Beatty and in 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 uh, uh, Bonnie and Clyde, uh, Clyde Barrow's character of, of an impotent mm -hmm. character, you know, and um, yes. you know, and uh, they said no, we can't go there. And I said, I don't, you know, I think this was the kind of the clue to what was troubling Jim, you know, and uh, then, oh, no, 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 we can't do any of this, um, or whatever. So Stone was very curious about it, and I said, I have my sources, how do you, how do you know this? Um, and I said, uh, you know, um, I interviewed some women who have verified it, and uh, they knew it, They and they were verified by the doors. Who were they? I can't tell you. <laughs> uh, um, well, I started out as a as a journalist, as a reporter, and so um, I honor my sources when they ask to be said. I will tell you, but I, I can't go on the record about it. Mm -hmm. And so that both women verified it, but would not go on the record for me. I think enough time has passed where possibly if I approach them again, I said, "Will you come out and talk about it?" And they they might agree to, but uh, at that time they wouldn't do it. But it was uh, I, for me, it made sense. It huge. It, it dramatically. It just filled in a, a huge uh, answered a huge question, which was what was the cause of Jim's angst, you know, and all this. So anyway, I, I explained that to. To Oliver, but he really wanted to know who they were, and I just wouldn't, um, I, I wouldn't tell him, you know. Um, so uh, I think he's, uh, and plus I didn't know where I fit in at this point, you know, because I had been uh, unceremoniously uh, fired from the project. I didn't know, are, am I coming back? Am I participating again? Mm -hmm. What? And uh, so uh, it, it wasn't clear, and Oliver didn't uh, shed any light in, in regards to that. So our meeting didn't really at last that long. But it did end with him saying, hey, you know, thanks for coming in. I appreciate all the stuff that you've done. And he said, your, your drafts have 
um, really inspired me a great deal. I'm going to go and write my draft now and then go make the movie. But when it's all said and done, I think the, the writer's guild will be very good to you, <laughs> which is, I guess, sort of a left handed compliment saying, hey, um, you know, we'll be sharing credit. Well, after all the time that went by after they shot it and everything, Writers Guild protocol is that they send you the shooting draft to all mm -hmm. the writers that particip participate in any movie on any movie. And I opened it up and looked at it, and it said the door is written and directed by Oliver Stone. And oh, okay, I guess he rewrote me. And I opened it up, and it's just oh shit. I mean, it's like that's mine, that's mine. That's like whoa, this is. A lot of mine. So anyway, uh, the protocol is that that the the guild itself will settle disputes, um, or it goes into an arbitration, and an anonymous mm -hmm. committee uh, assembles and they read all the drafts and then they compare them to the shooting script and all this rigmarole that goes on. But they ultimately, de this committee determines what the credit is. And the, they determined that the credit was written by me and Oliver Stone. No ampersand, you know, the word and. <laughs> <laughs> so that's, um, that's how, how, how that came about. So um, ultimately, I don't think he was happy about that. But um, uh, that's uh, that, uh, um, and he was getting ready to counter protest, but uh, then he he backed off, and so uh, the credit stands the way it is. So that's uh, <laughs> how's that wow. for a long-winded tale. There are more more salacious details, but time time is of the essence, young Adam. So. <laughs> <laughs> Well, uh, you know, we're, we're always up for any anecdotes that you want to share or, or well, feel comfortable sharing. I'll, I'll tell you the final thing is that, that I, I, um, uh, I, I never got invited. I don't know if Stone really had a, an official screening or not uh, of it, but I was never invited to it. And mm -hmm. um, so um, the, uh, the day the film opened, um, I – went to see it in a very large uh, theater in, in uh, West Los Angeles and um, with a bunch of friends of mine. And I had a friend of mine got me inside to see a press screening of the film beforehand. So I knew what it was, but now we were, it was, it was game day and uh, I was going to see it with a bunch of my friends in front of an actual audience. Um, so I was, uh, uh dating someone at the time who uh, was, was kind of late. I was waiting outside in front of the theater and then uh, waiting for her to show up. And she shows up and we come inside to where our seats were saved. And my roommate from college, who I'd mentioned before, Mike, uh, came running up to me and he said, uh, Oliver Stone's here. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, I said, oh, well, I said, I'm not surprised because there's stories of him like, you know, in the in the projection booth, you know, splicing things together at the <laughs> right like five minutes before it's actually going to be projected. You know, there's all you know, <laughs> just uh, in, in it to the very end. And I said, well, I'm not surprised, Mike, you know, and he said, well, aren't you going to go talk to him? I said, Mike, what are we what am I going to talk about? Our good times together there. You know, we didn't really share much. And, you know, I don't know if he's particularly a fan of me right now because he had to share credit with me. And. So I sat down and I sort of stewed for a few minutes. And then I thought, you know, what the hell? You only go around once in life. So I got up exactly. myself from my date and I got up and I went to the back of the theater. This is, of course, before the lights came down and, and the people are still waiting for the movie to sh start. And there's Oliver in the back. And he didn't look too good. He was just uh, looked like he'd been awake for a while probably splicing it <laughs> all together still. And uh, he was holding court with a group of people, and I waited till they all drifted away, drifted away, and then it's just finally Stone and myself there looking at each other, and I go, hey, and he goes, hey. And there's the kind of awkward silence, you know, and I, I go, do you remember me? And he looks at me, and he says, uh, no. Um, I said, I'm, I'm Randall, Randall Johnson. Uh, <laughs> no, not ringing any bells, you know. I said, I'm your co-writer. And his face goes, oh, 
Oh, man. <laughs> so good to see you. And he gave me a big slap on the back and kind of grabbed me and said, man, you know, the critics are they're fucking us, man. They're, you know, they have to see a movie with the people. <laughs> he gestured out to the whole, <laughs> oh, this and that. Oh, it was, it was, it was pretty funny. And I, I loved it. I loved that moment because that, that's just like, it's so Hollywood. You know, it's just uh, it's just one of those just uh, you know, kind of priceless moments for me in my career where it's just like, oh, wow. You know, after all this, we <laughs> don't even know who I am and we're sharing credit on this. So um, so that's 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 pretty much how that ended. I've run into Oliver a couple of times subsequently and uh, um, uh, not still isn't like a big a particularly big fan. <laughs> <laughs> oh, you know, that's too bad. He's just, uh, I don't know. I mean, one time I, he, I don't know if he even knew who I was again. Uh, and this other time he was pretty distant, you know, and just like, uh, oh yeah. So he mm. didn't, didn't want to talk about it. He was on to other, other projects, I think by that point. So, and I, I don't blame him, but you know, somebody like Oliver, um, you know, I, uh, one of the things I do respect about him is that this guy consumes everything uh, available to him about his subject. You know, he just devours yes. it. And my certainly my experience is when I'm working, uh, you know, on something and I get so absorbed in it, um, a lot of the ingredients of the stew get blended, you know, and it's hard to remember who said what or where you got certain ideas or whatever. And, you know, um, all you're concerned about is just writing the best possible script that you can, you know, as you see it. And, uh, you know, he, he probably just devoured mine and it was absorbed into his ratatouille uh, or whatever what recipe that he was conjuring up and it didn't matter if my name was on it or who's whoever names on it you know god will will sort it out at the end you know <laughs> yeah um, and so I, I i don't begrudge him he only met me that one time prior anyway for 30 minutes and given how many people that are in his life you know i don't i it, i don't blame him either for not recognizing me but i was hoping he might remember my name <laughs> <laughs> so, so. well and the, and the credit lives on that's something they can't take away from no, you so that's, that's, the, that's a good thing yeah that's quite true and uh so people may wonder why um the the spelling of my name is different now from the credit on on the doors and on dudes and um i think tales from the crypt that i also wrote um and that's because i got married and i kind of I, I i i swiped an a from my wife's maiden name and i kind of re uh redid johnson and so that's why it's spelled j-a-h-n now um so uh it 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 looks really weird but so some of my credits are are on the present spelling and some of my credits are previous uh, before i got married uh, it's spelled slightly different but i'm yeah i'm the same guy <laughs> okay yeah i was curious about that and i I, I was doing some research and just to make sure, and I said, "Oh yeah, I, th I think this is the same." So it's a, yeah, <laughs> it is the same guy. I, I I had no idea by when we did that because I got married in 1994, but um, you know, it's really helped in terms of Google searches and all that because it's such an unusual spelling. Uh, there were actually right. other Randy Johnsons and Randall Johnsons um, uh, that were being I was occasionally being confused with. Even there was another Randy Johnson in the Writers Guild who was female. Uh, who spelled her name with an I, but phonetically we were con being confused occasionally. And I thought, you know, I, I just want to, I want to be distinct, you know, so. <laughs> so well, yeah. Yes. Well, one, one other quick question I was curious about, uh, you know, any time that you're writing something, it kind of is like giving birth to a child in some way, shape or form. And um, metaphorically, if nothing else. And anyway, I just wanted to see if there was anything that didn't make the film that you were really sorry to see go. Uh, something that was near and dear to your heart. Or I'm always curious about that. Thanks for asking that. It's a good question. Um, well, look, uh, I mean, the mistake of some biopics is that they try to do a cradle to the grave kind of story. And you just can't do that in a feature film. You can do it if, if it's a limited series, you know, 
mm-hmm. uh, because you have the time to to get into that. But in a feature film, you know, two hours, two and a half hours at most. You know, even David Lean did. You know, <laughs> Lawrence of Arabia. You know, and and that's the comparison again I make because um, you know Lawrence led a very interesting life before World War One, and then after World War One, you know, he he left the army and then he reenlisted. In, under a, an assumed name, and then he was assigned to some just you know remote uh, 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 station somewhere in India, and and he was uh, designing submarines and airplanes and you know really modern warfare uh, weapons, you know, and so a very interesting guy, um, but he wasn't Lawrence of India. You know, um, the the right. you know David Lean, Robert Bolt, Michael Wilson, the 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 three you know visionaries of that. They said, no, this is the story. This is the defining three four years of this guy's life. Okay, and and we're going to focus on that. Forget about everything else, and then we're going to tell the hell out of it, out of just that narrow band of it. Okay, and that gives you a lot of freedom to do that. So um, for for Morrison, there I could have done stuff um, back in the day, you know, possibly. But I was bound legally; I could not show his parents in the film, except uh, for the uh, that early scene of the car wreck on the on the highway. Yeah, uh, out on the uh, 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 probably it was the Navajo reservation, you know, where that where that occurred. Um, but um, there was a moment, and it's it's really kind of a quiet moment um, in which uh, I wrote I wrote uh, several versions of the scene, but it was one that when Jim was fresh out of film school didn't have a clue what he wanted to do really and he was living on a in a flop house or on the roof supposedly of this place down, down on Venice Beach and he used to visit a place uh, a restaurant called um uh oh, somebody's name uh, uh so- the soul kitchen and that's where their song mm-hmm. their song was based on uh, but soul kitchen uh served soul food and it was run by an old uh, uh black woman uh, from the south, and they've served all that good soul food stuff. And Jim used to go in there a lot, and I think it was open till really, really late. So I was, I would start. I, I wrote several just scenes and just kind of moments where he would be in there late at night and writing in his notebook. And it would be very uh, kind of like a, a very Edward Hopper kind of looking place, you know, very spare and and all that, but. Um, and, and somewhat lonely and melancholy or whatever, but I've always thought of him being there and then occasionally having these conversations with the, with the, the Soul Kitchen's owner. Um, I forget her name. I want to say Olivia or something like that. Um, uh, it was like Olivia's Soul Kitchen, um, mm-hmm. you know. And so I, I would have liked to have seen more moments like that. One of my, my beefs about the movie, if I may say, I'm sure. And, yeah. and this is um, this is was due to through through my research in a lot of ways, uh, or that I, everyone that I interviewed, and I, I I probably had 50 hours of conversations with you know the surviving doors, Paul Rothschild who produced them, and, and just you know uh, Babe Hill, all their good friends, and and, and, and who who did uh, come forward. There were very conflicting perceptions of Jim. You know, there was nothing consistent in in any of it, which made it very difficult to kind of navigate and 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 cons- and, and pull a character out of this, you know, in a way. Mm-hmm. Um, but there were a couple of things that were consistent. And one was people said um, this was the smartest guy I ever met. I never met him. I, I never saw him without a book in his hand. And he was honest to the point of being almost cruel, brutal with the truth. Okay? Yeah. So um, 
those were things that that meant uh, uh, I, I think that that meant a lot to me and meant a lot to him that honesty. Okay, so going back to the movie, I felt that at one point, you know, the I, I got tired, simply tired of seeing him um, as the character lumbering around with a fifth of Jack Daniels in, in his hand, you know, mm-hmm. and our old Bushmills or whatever it was. I know he's drinking old Bushmills in the, in the opening bit, but, you know, just swigging the, the booze. And, and I, I felt that that gave the wrong impression of him that I wished on if Oliver had just subbed out that bottle of booze with, Nietzsche, Allen Ginsberg, On the Road, um, uh, the history of the Roman Empire, you know, I mean, he read <laughs> everything, you know, uh, Norman Mailer, any of any of those kinds of things, you know, to see him, that he was a reader, he was a thinker, you know, um, then even if he'd subbed it out just in a couple of scenes, we might have had a more favorable impression of him and of his intelligence. Se- and then secondly, be, um, going back to his his truth and his sort of the, his sense of accountability uh, with people, um, I think at some point, you know, he was he knew he was a lie or he knew that the public persona of the lizard king or whatever the hell that was, you know, it wasn't him. It wasn't right. truly him. And he couldn't live up to that. Mm-hmm. And he knew he was living a lie. So when that, when you know that, and then one of your own personal credos is to live honestly and to hold everyone else into that same kind of honesty. How can you reconcile that? You know, that would, yeah, that makes you want, that would make me drink. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> I'm living a lie. I am not what 10,000 screaming fans who want to jump in bed with me. I'm not what they think I am. Okay. Yeah. And, and so that creates great inner conflict. And and it's going to manifest in different ways in 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 behavior and you know relationships and, and all of that. So um, so those are the things that uh, I, I would you know we got definitely some of the rebellion and the and the pushback and the anger and the angst from him. But I wished I had seen a bit more of that intelligence, that sensitivity, um, that. Uh, um, that I know he had, you know. So those are some things that were left out um, as opposed to actual events. I mean, we never got, I, I, we never, we never saw them in Europe. That was very interesting. But a lot of that stuff was was uh, was just stuff that I felt like we know what's going to happen, or we've seen kind of seen it before. And the big question then also was, are we going to show his death? And I never wanted to show his death. Uh, because for me it was um, it was sort of anticlimactic. He he went to Paris and he died. Okay, mm-hmm. <laughs> I, that's that's almost like another chapter altogether. I felt again that this was um, this was an L.A. story. It was L.A. woman, you know, in a way. And the story was over when he left. When he left the band and he said goodbye to them when they were still mixing um, L.A. Woman. And uh, that's how I ended it, where it was a very bittersweet goodbye. The guys really weren't talking, and he stopped in and they at, at the studio where they were mixing the album and said goodbye and said he was going to Paris, and hardly anyone would talk to him, you know, and he left. And then Ray, I think I had Ray at the last second, he he jumped up and went, kind of out to the door but Jim was already gone you know by that time it's a little reminiscent of Lawrence of Arabia where <laughs> where, yeah. where he he leaves as as well and uh, Omar Sharif goes after him and uh knows that he's gone um so that was that was it I um I felt like that we didn't need to see the death you know um the it was it was really about other things 
Absolutely, yeah. That's uh, I'm always curious about the, um, like I said, because it's always close to the writer's heart, and when things don't make the final cut, that's I'm always curious to know what they, uh, things that were near and dear to them that that they wish could have made, uh, made the grade, so yeah. to speak. But uh, yeah, that's always interesting. But that's a battle. That's the battle always in it like is. this is like what to include and yeah. what not to include. And you know, mm-hmm. as as screenwriters, uh, we we don't have the luxury of novelists and and journalists to where um, you know you could you can cover hundreds of years like James Mishner did or. <laughs> you know, right. uh, in in their work, we have to fit something into uh, you know kind of like a shoebox, uh, and be able to present it in ninety minutes to two hours, and so that presents um, a lot of issues and and challenges. So, uh, chief of which is what to include, what not to include thematically. What is this story about? What are you trying to say? What do you want people to come away with? These 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 kinds of questions, inevitably something has to get left out, and that's just uh, the curse and the blessing of it. <laughs> this is, yeah, <laughs> spring matter. I'll tell you, this is the stuff that keeps you awake at night or drinking a ton of coffee and distracted, <laughs> and staring at that blinking cursor on your. <laughs> well, I find it in, endlessly fascinating, and uh, always the creative process and. It's always very interesting to me, and so and and the thing I, I I like about one of the other things I like about the film, and uh, this is some credit to you as well, is uh, that it doesn't adhere to the normal biopic structure. It's 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 a little bit different. I mean, uh, you know, it does have some of the things that we do see in the in the typical biopics, but but there, it does veer away from the typical structure that we've seen in so many of the others. Uh, and I, I do like that. There's a certain freshness to it. Um, I know that uh, a lot of the criticism was that the, you know, the Jim Morrison is presented in the film was not not a very likable character. Mm-hmm. But uh, you know, I, I I don't know. I found I found that um, to be a little bit of um, uh, refreshing as well <laughs> because uh, you know, in, in most of the biopics, you know, we're we're just forced to be sympathetic with these with with, with these people, and sometimes they're they're not always. Uh, it's not always the case. And so, anyway, I, yeah. I I think there are some fresh elements that I'm certain that you injected into the the, the writing of the film that uh, I really enjoy. Well, thank you for saying that. I mean, I, I one of my goals with this is that um, uh, at that time, again, this is still this is like 1986. You know, um, rock and roll films there, there weren't that many that had been done. And the most recent ones right. have been like the Buddy Holly story and the Richie Valen mm-hmm. story and stuff, which are all fine, you know, stories and this and that. But um, I, I felt like The Doors was just because of the nature of their music. It was about something different. And it was bigger than that. Um, it was bigger than one person's life. It was exploring a lot of things. And I felt like uh, I, I, the, the just the notion of a rock and roll epic um, it kept resonating with me. This is epic. You know, there's an epic story in this that in this person's life in, encapsulated in, in that. And I wanted to bring that forth. And I also wanted to strive to make it a very visceral film, to make it a very trippy film. You, know, mm-hmm. either you uh, take drugs or not or have or never will, but to get a sense of altered reality in, in a sense and to see the world as jim might have seen it um you know poetic beautiful strange uh you know overwhelming um you know uh that that to me is is exciting and i i really feel that we're seeing that so much more in filmmaking nowadays uh the directors are really getting into characters heads and we are seeing their we are seeing their stories or, or these characters through their their point of view more and more through their eyes and ears and and so it's like we're we're looking i mean imagine a story being told the narrative being told through Vincent van Gogh's goes of uh, you know eyes and ears you know what what does that look like 
you know? Right, you know, yeah. It's so different from Rembrandt's, right? It's so different mm-hmm. from Winslow Homer or something, you know? Um, but to get into there and to see more, see reality, see their, feel their pain, their ecstasy, their, their joy, um, uh, and that's exciting to me. I can, I can walk out the door and I, or I can turn on Netflix and watch any kind of, uh, you know, documentary about something. And that's all well and good, but I'm much more inspired by art and people who are pushing the envelope and like, what do they see? What do they hear? What's inside their heads that are, you know, making them this way that causes them to write this great poetry, to hear this music and create, recreate it. What is it? You know, um, and that's exciting to me. 